good evening, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Paul Whitaker. I'm in the biology department here at UW Marathon County. I'm also the previous chair of our first shared reading, shared thoughts committee. Uh, back in the fall of 2005, this committee got together to develop our first campus community shared reading program and dialogue for this year. Our, our mission was to provide a context for um, meaningful debates and discussions and dialogues both in and out of the classroom and both here at the university and in the community at large. Um, and our thought was by having everybody read a common book, we'd have a context for those discussions and dialogues. Uh, we wanted to pick a book that would challenge the way we viewed ourselves in our community. As most of you probably know, and maybe some of your students are sick of by now, the book that we chose was Affluenza, The All-Consuming Epidemic. This has been the all-consuming community shared read program. Um, the book Affluenza examines our compulsive materialism through the compelling metaphor of, of an infectious disease. It looks at the effects of overconsumption on individuals and communities and the global environment. The second section of the book looks at the causes of affluenza and the third looks at the cure, how we might recover from overconsumption. And our, tonight's speaker will help us kind of look at all three of those areas, I think. Our hope was that this community-wide community dialogue on affluenza would help us all to confront the difficult social and individual, economic and environmental issues associated with materialism and overconsumption. Thus far, we're very pleased with the response, both in the community and here at the university, to this shared reading program. And um, as a result, I'd like to acknowledge some of the sponsors that have made this whole year-long program of, of readings and speakers and panel discussions <coughs> possible. Um, we've had support from the B&A Esther Greenheck Foundation, the Harvey Nelson Charitable <coughs> Trust, the Clyde F. Schluter Foundation, UW Colleges, the UWMC Foundation, UWMC Student Life and Interest Committee, Wisconsin Public Television, for which tonight's presentation is being taped, and also the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin. When we began thinking about events to complement the shared reading part of this, we were very excited to come across Steve Sandstrom's information up at Northland College. Steve's day job is serving as the environmental education coordinator for the Sigurd Olson Environmental Institute at Northland College. He's got extensive professional and personal experience working with environmental education, green building techniques, um, and green consumerism, and, and lately in sustainable community development. In addition, he and his wife Nancy operate an award-winning green bed and breakfast in Bayfield called the Pinehurst Inn. We're delighted that Steve was willing to travel all the way from Bayfield to be with us tonight. At the end of Steve's talk, he's agreed to take some questions, but because this program is being taped, we'll ask you to present your questions through a microphone and we'll have two student ambassadors wandering uh, the aisle. So if you've got a question at the end of the talk, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone so that your question will be on the taped program. Earlier today, Steve gave a soapbox lecture for the College of the Emeriti, and that was very well received, very enthusiastic and inquisitive audience. And he also presented two classroom sessions today, and he's agreed to come back tomorrow for a third classroom session. So we're making him work very hard in his visit here in Wausau. Um, so please help me welcome Steve Sandstrom. I forgot one other thing that I wanted to announce, and that is the next event in our, in our Affluenza Shared Read program is next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here in the theater. We've got a panel discussion on thinking locally about consumption and sustainability, what's possible. And we'll have some people from the local area as well as some people from far away. So, what? The reception. Oh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. And also, after, after the question and answer session tonight, there will be a reception in the terrace room just outside to the right with some refreshments and some chance to talk to Steve and other people in the audience more informally. So please join us for that, too, afterwards. And with that, Steve. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. The, uh, it was so great to see that your community has picked this book, Affluenza, as a, a way to sort of bring this whole issue uh, to the forefront. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm personally feeling that this, for the first time in many years, where I really have a strong feeling of hope for our future. 
Um, this is a growing movement around the country. People are finally getting it. And uh, it's very, very encouraging for our planet. And let's see if I can, oh, there we go. Um, we hear an awful lot about how terrible the big corporations are. And the big question, of course, are the big corporations really to blame for global climate change? Well, you might say that, but the, many of you might remember the old Pogo comic. You know, he said, we have met the enemy and he's us. And because if we remember that companies sell what we're willing to buy. And you might talk about how they can manipulate your thinking and, and make you think that you really need a product, but bottom line, you're the one who buys it. And as consumers, we have to, as a group, start to really become much more cognizant about our consumer habits, and we really need to become more responsible and start to do a better job of investigating the impact that our buying decisions have not just on the environment, but also on people. And we can't just take the word of the product manufacturer or the marketers. We have to start being willing to do our own, little, our own homework. When we start to consider little tidbits of information like this, where as a country, we only make up 5% of the world population, actually it's closer to 4.5% now, we use 25% of all the natural resources of the entire planet. One twentieth of the population uses 25% of all the resources. You might start to understand why some countries don't like us. Uh, that's uh, not good. I mean, if we were, if all, you know, if we had the whole world using uh, resources the way the U.S. and Canada does, we'd need four more planets, like planet Earth. Now, obviously, we don't have the option of going out in the solar system and uh, using another planet. We're sort of stuck with trying to make do with what we have. And so the only true option is, is we have to change our behavior. About a year ago, this magazine came out, this issue of Time, front cover, says, be worried, be very worried. It, it was one of the first times that a national publication came out and really broadcasted the fact that global warming is real. And in this past year, we've seen Al Gore in his film, uh, uh, Inconvenient Truth, there's been a number of efforts that have really started to help people understand that this is good science, good strong research that backs up this whole idea. And finally, people are getting it. This is from the paper just a few weeks ago. You know, a survey that's done that shows that most of the world understands that the global warming is an issue. Less than half of people in this country that were questioned, thought it was uh, a critical threat, though about four out of 10 thought it was important but not critical. Um, so there, it's changing, but the rest of the world is still ahead of us in understanding the consequences. Another article recently, poor will suffer the most. You know, as the global climate uh, changes, the world faces increased hunger, water shortages in the poorer countries, massive floods, avalanches in Asia, and species extinction unless nations adapt to climate change and halt its progress. This last report that came out just a few weeks ago, based on 29,000 sets of data, most of which were collected in the last five years. Again, at this point, I don't think there's much question that we've got an issue that was man-made. And we, as consumers, uh, have been responsible. And we have to take responsibility for helping to make this change. All right, come on. Now, just a couple of slides. I'm sure you've heard this a ton of times already in the last year. 
But there's evidence that can't be ignored. You look at the ice cover at the North Pole. Uh, dramatic changes in, in just a, a couple of decades. Some of the evidence that I find most compelling is the work that has been done at the South Pole where they are doing uh, ice cores. Uh, unlike the North Pole, which is ice floating on water, at the South Pole it's a landmass, it's a continent. And so every year when it snows, it builds up. And so it leaves layers of snow that get compressed. And they're able to drill down into those layers and actually have a record of the snowfall and basically of what the climate was like at that particular year going back hundreds of thousands of years. Now what's interesting is they're able to take those cores and actually separate that ice into wafers uh, and look at individual years and all you can see all the little air bubbles in that sample. Well they're able to go in there with some pretty sophisticated equipment and actually analyze the, the molecules of the different gases that are in those little air bubbles and actually can determine the concentration of the different atmospheric gases in each of those years going back hundreds of thousands of years. Now, let's just look at the last 18,000 and you can see something rather dramatic. If I can figure out how to use this laser pointer. Ah. There's two lines on this graph. You've got a red line that represents the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and it's plotted on the same graph along with the average temperatures during that same period of time. You'll notice that there's a definite correlation on this, on this graph where the, the line for the carbon dioxide has always stayed below the line for the temperature, but they, all, they both seem to move together. Now if I had the whole 600,000 years of data, it's much more obvious because you have some bigger hills and valleys, but those two lines say parallel basically to each other all through that long period of Earth history. Now, what's very, very dramatic is look at the very end over here. See that red line? Spikes right up almost to the corner of the graph. Now, if you've got a record of temperature and concentration of CO2 that has always shown this relationship where when one goes up, the other goes up. It goes to follow that that temperature line is going to go up to get up ahead of that red line of the carbon dioxide concentration. You've got 600 years of record, 600,000 years of record that show that. Now, that last little line, oops, Go back. Represents the last 150 years on our planet. And what coincides with the last 150 years? Industrial Revolution. The point at which we started to use a significantly higher level of fossil fuels. And so if you, quote, if you just plotted that last set of lines, it's very, very dramatic to see how that CO2 line goes up very quickly in the last 150 years. Other concerning things. Colorado River no longer makes it to the ocean. Now, have any of you ever seen the Colorado River? I mean, it's a huge river. I mean, millions of gallons of water are piling down this river, but by the time it gets to the ocean, we've pulled all the water out of it. And the vast majority of that is from irrigation. On the other end of global warming, the one part of our planet that helps to sequester the carbon dioxide is our forests, pulling that carbon back out of the atmosphere. And what are we doing? Well, we're cutting down the tropical rainforest to plant crops. And uh, Again, not, not helping the global warming situation. 
This is a lot of text on one slide, and I know it's a faux pas for PowerPoints to have all this much information on one slide, but this is so important. I w really want to read this. This is Brent, was uh, something that Gaylord Nelson wrote uh, back in 1994. We are rapidly building a world in which the question of health and peace and prosperity sooner or later will be moot because we have crippled the very engine of life that makes it all possible. The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. All economic activity is dependent upon the environment with its underlying resource base. When the environment is finally forced to file under Chapter 11 because its resource base has been polluted, drained, cut down, dissipated, or irretrievably compromised, the economy goes down to bankruptcy with it. The economy in reality is just a subset of the ecological system. I love this because it explains it in economic terms, which I hope some of the business people of the world start to understand that we can't keep economic development in one part of our community and environmentalists over in this part of the community and never talk to one another. We're all part of the same system. What we're talking about is trying to become more sustainable as a community. And basically all that means is that we create a balance between environmental health, economic sustainability, and social justice. A balance that will lead to a world where the human and biological communities can thrive together indefinitely. That's really what st sustainability is all about. We have to start looking for those opportunities between the issues within the economics or in the economy and the environment and, and social issues and really start to work on them together. Because if we can do that, we can reach a much more harmonious community. And for too long, those have been separate ideas that are talked about separately and no, nobody ever gets together and sees the connections. And that's a piece that has to change. Now there's one other thing that I add to this picture. I can get this to work there. Is the context by which all of our decisions need to be made. For some reason, we seem to have lost our connection with our moral compass. And for some people, that's an organized religion. For others, it's just their own personal, personal spirituality. But for, we have to get back to realizing that no matter what we do, whether it's part of our job at work or the corporation that we run, or whether we're at home teaching our children, whatever, it's got to be guided by this moral compass. And that we seem to have lost our way. And that we have to reconnect. And, and that's so critical right now in our communities. Why does this work sometimes and not other times? There. A better way, instead of looking at those interlocking circles, is to think of it as Gaylord Nelson was just talking about, that we have one major system, which is our planet, our environment, but inside of that bigger system, we have human society. And then inside of human society, we have our economy. But they're all nested systems. They're not separate. All of these are interconnected. You know, our Native American brethren had this figured out centuries ago, long before Europeans ever hit the shores of North America. Uh, the Iroquois Feder Confederacy talks about, in their great law, in every deliberation we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. Now let's just put that into perspective for a second. Imagine going in to an auto dealership and looking at different models and saying, hmm, let's see, if I get this model right here, how will that impact my great, 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 great granddaughter? Well, I've never thought of it that way. I don't know about you. But that's the kind of transition that we have to start going through in, in thinking about 
how we purchase uh, things and how we live our lives. We have to think to the future, not a month ahead or the next quarter's financial statements or one year from now. It's got to be 150 years from now. If we had started to do that 150 years ago, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. All right, so what can we do? Use less stuff is a good start. Bottom line is consumers, American consumers are wasteful. Our whole system is designed on obsolescence. You buy things that break down or are just made to be disposable. I mean, think, think of all the products. Electric toothbrushes that you can't change the battery in. When the battery wears out, you throw it away. How ridiculous is that? But that's, we, there are many, many products on the market today. They're designed to be thrown away. It's very wasteful. We have to, in general, start to think about changing what we consume and what we buy. And in, in the whole broad sense of things, to use less stuff. Well, let's get a little more specific. Let's talk a little bit about the food that we eat and the impact the food uh, production system in this country has on the environment. We just sold the slide about the Colorado River. Look at this where you see that 70, the big purple line on this, or bar, represents water usage in this country. 73% of all the water in the United States is used in the food industry. Irrigation, food processing, uh, meat, meat processing, and so forth. 73%. I mean, we could all change to low flow toilets and shower heads and everything else in our home, and it's not going to amount to anything if we don't make some changes in the way we produce food. That's a, just a huge amount of water. Land, of course, the blue bar on the left, half of the land. Use issues that we have in this country are, is for agriculture, makes sense. Um, but look at the, in the middle, the bar 38% goes is uh, common water pollution as a result of agriculture. And what this graph, it also shows that 12% of all the greenhouse gases that go into our atmosphere come from agriculture. Now, rather disturbing statistic here, 17% uh, if you include, well that's different, for, that's a 12 on the other. This is a more recent uh, number. But a huge percentage of the fossil fuels in this, or a large percentage of the fossil fuels in this country are used in agriculture. What's sort of disturbing is that right now it takes three calories of fossil fuel energy to get one calorie of food energy. That isn't sustainable. And the only way that that's been allowed to happen is because we've had very cheap fuel. Fossil fuels have been cheap for a long, long time. We never would have been able to develop an agricultural system that was that wasteful in energy if the energy source wasn't cheap. Well, it's not so cheap anymore. And we're going to start to run out. But the processes we use in agriculture use a lot of fossil fuels. All of the synthetic fertilizers that are used are based on petroleum, or made from petroleum, and they actually make up a greater percentage in that number that I just showed of the fossil fuels than what it costs, or what the, we use for the tilling and cultivating and harvesting of the crops. Right now in this country, the average distance food travels to get to your dinner plate is 1,400 miles. Think of the amount of fossil fuels it takes just to transport food that distance. So what can we start to do differently? Well, we can start trying to produce some of our own food. Now, for this is more practical for some people than others, but it's not that unusual, and it wasn't that long ago that that was far more common. Uh, where people had their own backyard gardens. And uh, Second World War, people talked about having their victory gardens and growing food uh, for themselves uh, during the war. And 
most people, especially in rural areas, have had their own gardens, and out of that has fallen to the wayside, where people just don't garden the way they used to. So we could make a difference by having growing some of our own food. Another big change is to start concentrating more on buying food locally. Looking for uh, partnerships in your community with local farmers. Many communities now have cooperatives available where you can buy food, uh, organic products, uh, not, it doesn't have to be just organic, but most of them are concentrating on organics, which use very much less fuel. They don't use any fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers, which come from petroleum. So that helps to really reduce that, that number, fo uh, the fossil fuels number. So trying to look at ways to concentrate on buying local, uh, buying your food local, can make a huge difference. And very often the locally grown produce, you know, is much better. It looks great and it tastes great. It hasn't been squashed in the truck bed for 1,200 miles. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, it's more expensive. I can't really afford it. Well, I would, I would challenge you to really look at your total food budget and s start really examining how much processed food you buy and really look at that cost per ounce of things like lean cuisine lasagna uh, or any of the other prepackaged, prepared meals and figure out what you're actually paying per pound for some of those items. And I think you'll find that you can go to your co-op and buy fresh produce and fresh pastas, organic pastas, make your own, and it's not going to be any more expensive and a whole lot better for you and you haven't, don't have all the packaging and the transportation issues that the Stouffer's Lean Cuisines uh, require. Another thing that all of us could really think about is if we're meat eaters, where does that meat come from? Where are you buying uh, your beef or, or poultry or pork, whatever, but focusing here on beef. If we were to really think about cutting down just 10 per, by 10% how much beef we eat that came from feedlot raised operations like this, it would provide enough food or the equivalent amount of grain available to feed 60 million people. Now the other piece of that is that grain, the corn and, and oats and so forth, are planted primarily using the traditional industrial agricultural techniques that use tons of fertilizer and fossil fuels. And so not only is it going to leave, uh, help the environment um, in this case, uh, it, it's a much better uh, choice. And if you're going to eat beef, all right, come on. You don't have to give up eating beef. Just think about where it's been raised. And, and grass-fed cattle, uh, if it's done correctly, can really be a very sustainable practice. I mean, you think about the buffaloes roaming on the prairie for millions of years, and they really interacted with the grass the same way that cattle do. I mean, I would love to see a field full of buffalo instead of cattle. Um, they actually are quite good eating as well. But the point being is that there are alternatives available where you don't have to make drastic changes in your diet and still have a very positive impact uh, on the planet and on, on people. Again, really trying to concentrate on, on buying locally and, and helping your local economy, uh, eliminating those transportation costs uh, can make a, a great deal of difference. Uh, a, a real popular uh, op option right now is, is uh, sustain or community supported agriculture, CSAs. There's a, I know there's a number of them here in Wausau. Uh, Wisconsin actually has more CSAs than any other state in the country. But the whole idea behind this is, is you work directly with the farmer. And uh, there's different plans, but bottom line, uh, you pay a fee to the farmer and in return he provides you with a certain amount of produce each, each month as it's harvested. But usually it requires that you give him some of the money in advance so that he has money in the spring to do the planting and so forth. 
and then it helps him with uh, or her with her cash flow on their farm and also you take a little bit of the responsibility for the risk if it's a bad season or drought or whatever you don't get as much food back either so it helps to maybe distribute uh, the financial loss which makes it easier for the farmer to stay in business as well you don't put all the load on the farmer every time if you have a bad bad year another thing we can do is start to really focus on bulk packed foods using your own containers your own shopping bags and if you have the option buy in bulk that is a number of advantages one if you think enough in advance you only go to the store a couple times a, a month maybe or less so you reduce the transportation costs you have you know the food available at home in in larger quantities it and usually you get a better price break when you buy it in larger quantities so there's uh, many advantages to this and you don't have all that packaging that you throw away this happens to be in our kitchen and uh, we try to buy as much as we can in bulk and we have large bins down in our uh, off our basement steps there's a little pantry area and then we have other glass jars that we have in the kitchen that we bring up a smaller amount to have ready in the kitchen but we don't have a, a pantry filled with cardboard boxes with two dozen types of cereal and you know everything else that sits in there it uh, we really have tried our best to eliminate as much of that packaging as possible interesting in um, maybe some of you have heard about this in Germany the grocery stores are now responsible for taking back any of the packaging if you buy the product and when the package is empty you can bring the empty box back to the grocery store and they're responsible for getting rid of it or recycling it or whatever so guess what the, a lot of the stores are doing they're offering bulk packaging yeah they, they just have a couple of the boxes on display and then they have a bin that you have to go in and scoop it out and put it in your own package so they don't have to deal with all the waste all right another big area that we can make some immediate changes uh, to help our planet is in transportation and in the cars and, and light trucks that we use what's most dramatic here you look at almost half of the toxic air pollution in this country comes from our cars and trucks 28% of greenhouse gases comes from our cars and trucks now you might be surprised that that number would have been higher um, as you'll see in the next graph where a lot of that the greenhouse gases come from and this does not include uh, semis and you know the big transportation industry this is just personal <coughs> use here that 28 percent for greenhouse gases some encouraging news in 2007 what sold more a Prius finally yay it just started in 2005 Prius the Prius sold more than Hummers um, now it's a dramatic difference uh, way more Priuses this year than Hummers were sold but there's a uh, just some calculations here I want to share with you because I think sometimes we get a little bit too focused on blaming people that drive big SUVs as being the problem and if you look at this uh, it's not just the SUVs that are at fault here this is mind-boggling to me but I in researching this the United States we buy 17 million cars a year that just blows me away 17 million cars and of those this past this is a year old these are year old figures now but out of that 26 percent were SUVs and of the 26 percent of those uh, of, of there's only 11 and a half percent are the truck based SUVs or the really big ones and there was only 30,000 Hummers <coughs> sold in the whole country you know that's it not not a, a lot well, that's, I mean, 30,000 is a big number, but by comparison to 17 million, it's not a big number. 
But what's interesting is if you make some simple calculations, I, I went and I looked up the average miles per gallon for large SUV or the SUVs, um, and then the average miles per gallon for the standard car, and figured if they all drove 15,000 miles in a year in their car, the SUVs would consume 2 billion gallons of gasoline, but the rest of us consumed 9 billion. So even though if you're by percentage, I mean, they're, they may use more, the fact of the matter is we aren't going to have a significant impact in the reduction of, of fossil fuels in this country unless all of us make some significant changes in the way we drive and how much we drive. The simplest thing all of us can do is really start to be conscious of our driving behavior. Now I put together a little simple chart and this is not based on any scientific data other than my own guesses, but it just makes a point. You would think, wouldn't you, that the blue line represents what you might expect to be true. That the slower you go, the better the gas mileage should be in the car. Wouldn't you think that? I mean, the faster you go, you're pushing the pedal down, you're opening the, the fuel injectors, you're pumping more gas into the engine, you're higher RPMs, you should be using more gas, right? I mean, that seems logical. Yet the actual line is closer to the truth that we get worse gas mileage when we go slow than when we get up to the middle speeds and if you ever look on the new car, on, at the sticker in a new car, what does it show? City driving, lower miles per gallon, than highway driving. Now that's, doesn't that seem backwards? But why? Why is that? Who knows? Yeah, it's our driving behavior. And think about when you come up to a stop sign, do you just slowly push the gas pedal down and sort of slowly gain speed? No, what do people do? put it to the floor, zoom out, and you're wasting tons of fuel doing that. Uh, we all do it, you know, when you go to pass a car or, or whatever, you know, we, we act like, you know, gas is cheap or something. And we, we can make a huge difference. They estimate that we can change our gas mileage by changing our driving behavior by as much as 20%. By, all, by just changing our driving behavior, not doing anything to the car, by just thinking more about how hard we push down on that gas pedal. Now what's really interesting, the Prius, have any of you ever driven a Prius? Oh good, some of you have. They've got a little computer screen. And on that computer screen, it tells you what your miles per gallon is while you're driving. Now, who, those that have a Prius, do you find yourself looking at that number and trying to make sure that you keep that number higher? I think that should be mandatory in every car. Because people would start to concentrate on their driving behavior, trying to keep that computer number or that miles per gallon number higher. And it's pretty amazing and that when I have driven a Prius, I became very uh, fixated on that number realizing, boy, you go up a hill, you know, the Prius was getting 60 miles to the gallon, and all of a sudden you're going up, to the, up a hill and you're getting 15. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting that by just the, how hard we pushed on on that gas pedal. So we can say all we want about buying cars with better gas mileage, which is important, but all of us can walk out of the door tonight and immediately make a difference in helping our planet and global warming by just changing our own driving behaviors. Now there are alternatives that if you're going to buy a new car, certainly consider getting a hybrid. And there are hybrids now to fit just about anybody's needs. Uh, there are SUVs that are hybrids. You've got small two-person cars. You've got four-passenger uh, cars. There's even a, a pickup truck now. Uh, Chevy's come out with a full-size pickup truck with a hybrid engine in it. Um, which gets significant better gas mileage than their standard pickup. You know, they get, right now, I think it's 60 miles, even the newer ones I think are even a little better than 60 miles for the gallon. 
But what you have to remember is the Prius does better in the city than the highway. So they really are great for those of us or those people who commute to work within the city where they don't ever get up to freeway speed. Then, you re then pre a, pre or a hybrid really makes a difference. If you spend most of your time on the highway, you don't really get the full advantage of that electric engine because you're using the gasoline engine more. But there's other alternatives for us to think about. Biodiesel is a growing market, uh, and biodiesel fuel has much, uh, a much lower emission level than standard diesel. If it's made uh, with the right crops, you are almost carbon neutral. You're taking carbon that came from a plant that just took that carbon out of the atmosphere a few months ago, and you burn it in your car and you put it back in the atmosphere. So it's a real recent cycle, which is different than when you take the carbon from fossil fuels that has sat in the earth for 400 million years, and then we add it to the atmosphere. So biodiesel is a possibility. Even regular diesel, now that the low sulfur diesels that they're, uh, fuels that they're coming out with, um, diesel engines get better gas mileage than a gasoline engine. Uh, there are some pollution issues with, with diesel, but if you use biodiesel, it, it cuts those down significantly. And um, another alternative, this happens to be my car. I converted a car to run on grease. And I go around to our local restaurants and uh, collect grease and, and filter it and use that, use just straight fryer grease and run the car. But I just added a second tank where the spare tire went in the car. And you need to add a heating system off of the engine cooling system on the engine to heat up the, the grease. Because the, the grease has to be about a, over 140 degrees to, to act like diesel fuel. But when it's warm, it works exactly the same way as diesel fuel in your engine. So you just have to make a few modifications. You have to have a heated fuel filter. Um, it's basic plumbing. It's, you don't have to be an a automotive mechanic to figure out how, how to do this. If you did, I wouldn't have done it. Um, but you just heat up that oil and uh, you can run it in your car. You have to wait for it to heat up a little bit, so you have to have a gauge that tells you what the temperature is. And when it gets to the right temperature, you hit the little toggle switch, and it switches over uh, to your grease tank. And then you can run on recycled fryer grease. Not exactly something for that everyone is going to do. Um, but interestingly enough, they figure that recycled grease could make, could probably add up to about 3% of the diesel market in this country. But coincidentally, that's about how much oil we would get from drilling in Anwar in Alaska. So it's pretty significant. Little math on the cost of my car, which is sort of interesting. I got it for off of eBay for $2,800 and uh, put some money into it, fixed it up a little bit, 1800 bucks. Uh, put in a con this conversion kit for about 800 bucks, and some other filtering supplies. The whole thing cost me about $5,700. And payback, uh, if diesel fuel is 275 a gallon, uh, it's more than that right now, um, it would take less than a year to pay for the conversion just in the fuel savings. And I'll pay for the whole car in four and a half years just because I'm on the amount of fuel I save. So it's not a bad investment. It is for, that car's for sale if anybody would like to buy it though. Just, you know, <laughs> I've upgraded now. I've got a, a diesel Jetta. And uh, I'm going to get my own biodiesel processor to make my own biodiesel fuel. All right, other things you can do related to your car. And this is sort of surprising, but just change, making sure your tire pressure is good can, can increase your gas mileage by 3% just by making sure your tires are inflated correctly. Now multiply that times 17 million vehicles. And how much you know, gasoline does that save? That's very significant by simple little things. In larger communities, this is maybe a better option than smaller communities. But 
there are more and more of these share a car programs starting up where you don't own your own car, you sort of have it cooperatively or you have sort of a leasing arrangement, you pay a monthly fee and there are, there's a lot of car, you know, with several cars that you sort of own jointly and people share them uh, when they need to, to, you know, go out of town or whatever else. It's a great concept and uh, um, you don't have to own your own car. Uh, there's some neighborhoods that are starting to do this with uh, a backup vehicle or a pickup truck. You know, sometimes you just wish you had that pickup to go to the comp to take your compost or wherever, or, and you just don't want to throw it in the trunk of your car. Well, now there's blocks in this, you know, where you have eight or ten neighbors that have all decided to buy a, a, a little pickup truck that they all jointly own instead of everybody having their own. People are doing the same thing with snow blowers and lawnmowers. You know, instead of everybody owning their own lawnmower and have this one little one-sixth of an acre, you know, lot and, you know, have a John Deere riding lawnmower, you know, you've got eight people on the block that own one lawnmower collectively. And, again, just makes great sense and cuts down. We don't have the pollution. We don't, we aren't using up the, the, the as much resources to manufacture them and a lot of good reasons. You're finding more and more opportunities in, for jobs that allow telecommuting where you can work from home, which could be a huge savings for in transportation costs and fuel costs. Carpooling, another obvious example. I, it always drives me crazy uh, how many times I see people you know, driving back and forth to work, they're the only person in the car. And I, I'm, I'm as guilty. I do the same thing. And it doesn't take that much to work out with your couple of neighbors to start you know, taking turns driving. You know, trying to use your bicycle or walking more uh, is a great alternative and something that you see much more in Europe than you do here. This is a shot in Sweden of a uh, an older woman who's doing her shopping using her bicycle. And uh, this, there's a, a real opportunity for doing, for doing that in this country that's just being passed up because of this mental model we have that you're supposed to use your car. Of course, we've really passed up mass transit opportunities in this country. Europe has taken advantage of this for years and years. Um, but we should really be trying to focus more on mass transit instead of everybody owning their own cars. Uh, tuning up your engine, another thing that can make a huge difference in your gas mileage. Uh, again, uh, saving on fossil fuels. Here's one that you'd be surprised at. If you leave a, a canoe rack or a kayak rack on the roof of your car when you're not hauling your kayak around, that can drop your gas mileage 12% because of the drag of that kayak rack or bike rack that's on the, on the hood of your car. So it might be a pain in the ass to take it on and off all the time, but you know, it's worth it. Another thing to consider is fly less. Now some people have a job that requires flying. Uh, you might think about it the next time you're going to take a vacation, if maybe there is a different way to, to get to the destination you're going to. But they're just starting now to research the implication of all of the f exhaust, jet exhaust, that's going into the atmosphere and what it's doing. You just look here, this is the contrails uh, that's forming clouds in the desert over Las Vegas. And what does that do to, to the climate? Here's another shot over the North Sea. All of the jet contrails that have actually created a total cloud cover. And what does that do? What are what chemicals? You know what, what's in those clouds that are formed? What what? How is that impacting global warming? There's just a ton of questions that uh, are concerning scientists right now about the uh, the amount of of carbon dioxide and toxins and and greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere from jet engines. Last section of this, household operations. 
Look at that bar on the, on the right hand side. 35% of all greenhouse gases come from our homes. What do you suppose that is? Where, what's in your home is, is air conditioning and heating, right? And we're using, if most of that's from electricity that's coming from coal burning power plants or burning fossil fuels in your furnaces, whether it's natural gas or oil. All of that is putting the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. And we don't make that connection very often, that greenhouse gases have anything to do with our home. And it, and it really does. And a couple other quick examples, too, with, with uh, changing our bind patterns. You know, if, we use, again, as Americans, 27% of all of the wood you, you know, harvested worldwide, just 5% of the world's population. But simple things we can do that make a huge difference. I love this one. If all of us were to just buy one roll of toilet paper made from recycled paper fiber, that would save the equivalent of 297,000 trees. Now imagine that how it would change you know, how we use our forests if we weren't using them to make toilet paper. There's no reason in the world why we shouldn't all be using toilet paper made from 100% recycled fiber. A simple little change that could make an immediate difference. Looking at the labels on products is another one. Um, people are starting to become more conscious of this. Looking to see what's in them and are they earth friendly. You can go to stores now that will have whole sections that are just earth friendly, non-toxic, biodegradable, organic, uh, for every household need. Dishwasher soap, laundry detergent, toilet cleaner, you know, window cleaner, everything. You can find op or products available today that are totally non-toxic, biodegradable, and work just as well as the standard products and don't put any toxins into the environment. This was a shot at the uh, co-op right in, in Ashland uh, where I shop. At our bed and breakfast inn, we use all these products. And a real interesting side benefit is our housekeepers have commented to us how when they've worked at other places, they always had to wear gloves whenever they cleaned the windows or whatever else, they'd get rashes. Um, they don't have to wear gloves at our inn. The materials they, that we use are completely safe. And in fact, some of them, the, the person we bought them from says you could literally drink it if you wanted to, uh, and it wouldn't hurt you. Um, it smells, I, I, I'm not about to do that. But, but you know, recycling is, an, I mean, this is one that most people have been thinking about more than a lot of these other issues for a long time. Uh, paper, of course, glass, plastic, these are ones that I think probably the majority of people are starting to recycle. But there's other things that we have to think about too, our organic kitchen waste, food waste. We should be composting that. There's absolutely no reason why that should go into garbage and end up in a landfill. It can be totally broken down very quickly with a very simple little bin in your backyard. Compost does not stink. I think there's a, a lot of people who think it's going to be unsightly and smelly. If you do it right and have, have the right kind of, you know, simple little compost bin, it does not smell, it does not attract animals. Um, where I live, we have black bear all over the place, and I can't even think about putting out bird feeders around our house in the summer because the bears will trash them, but they have never touched our compost bin, ever. And it's within 20 feet of the bird feeders. And so it's not an issue with uh, attracting pests or anything else. How about recycling clothing? When you're done with clothing, you know, what do you do with it? Throw it out or you give it to Goodwill? Uh, are there other people that can use it? Same way with appliances. Uh, one of the neatest things I've seen develop in the last few years are these free cycle websites. Have any of you seen these? Where you can post articles that you want to get rid of on there that people can come and get for free. Uh, 
uh, it's a great idea. And, there, and in fact, some of the recycling centers are now setting up free cycle centers at the recycling center where they just have a little uh, storage shed with shelving where you can put usable items. They're not, you know, wrecked or broken. They're still usable, but you don't need them anymore. And maybe there are people who are less fortunate or uh, who could use a, a toaster or whatever else. Uh, and if it's there, they can have it for free. I think it's a, a, great, a great system. All right, back to that first uh, comment about home heating and, and the fossil amount of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. I wanted to just compare for a minute uh, what I was able to observe in, a, in Sweden and how they work to heat their homes and to sort of give you an idea of what's possible compared to what's happening in this country. Falkenberg, Sweden has a district heating system for a good section of, of their city, which means they, people don't have individual furnaces in their home. You have a central heating plant, and then you have steam pipes that go under the streets, and you hook, hook up to the steam pipe just like you'd hook up to the sewer. You know, and, you, and then you have your, your radiators in your home. Much more efficient system than everybody having their own heating plant in their home. So they've been doing this since 1984. And the, they, the city already existed in 1984. I mean, so this was retrofitted. It wasn't something that they did uh, brand new. But here's what's fascinating. Look at the amount of their total energy that comes from renewable sources. Wood chips 80, is 82% of, of their heat in these district heating plants come from wood chips. Only that teeny little black sliver on the right-hand side is oil, and the blue pie-shaped piece is fossil gas. Less than 10% of their heating in their district heating plants is coming from fossil fuels. 90% is coming from renewable sources. Well, guess what Wisconsin's pie chart looks like? Notice renewables, 2.3% is renewables, and the rest, well, you've got a big chunk of, of nuclear in Wisconsin, 20, almost 20%, but the rest is all fossil fuels. And in Wisconsin, instead of seeing emissions going down, our emissions are increasing for carbon dioxide. Not a good sign. And what's even, even more distressing is when you look at this uh, map of proposed coal-fired power plants uh, in the Midwest, there, right now there are five new coal-fired plants uh, being proposed in Wisconsin. Uh, definitely not heading in the right direction. There are 15 in, in Illinois. Now there are other options. This is our, up at our inn. We, we have a, this is our guest house. And we heat all the hot water for our guests with a solar collector uh, next to the building. And uh, it, we figure it'll pay back at the cost in about eight years. So we'll, in eight years we'll have free heat. So you have an upfront investment. Sort of a, it's sort of an investment in the future pay a little more now, so you pay a lot less later. And that's a change in thinking. Most people are real caught up in the Walmart mentality. Right? Buy things at the lowest price possible. And so when we think about adding systems into our home, such as water heaters or furnaces, we figure, well, let's see, what can I get away with? What's the cheapest? You know? But we don't think about the long-term cost of that decision. Now that, the collector for our house, that was $12,000. Now that, not just the collector, but the, the storage tanks, the installation, the 100 feet of underground line to the house, all that was about $12,000. We got about a 10% uh, grant for that cost from Focus on Energy. And I could have bought a water heater to heat the water for that building for about 400 bucks. So up front, huge difference. 
But in eight years, I have a free, I have free heat for heating the hot water. Now the bills for heating, if I had gone with that cheap, you know, $400 heater, my monthly heating bills would have been horrendous um, compared to what I'm even paying now, just the extra money on the mortgage, you know, for that extra 12 grand, um, it's still a better deal. And eventually it will be uh, free. But there's lots of other things you can do in your home to, again, make an immediate difference. Replacing incandescent light bulbs with compact fluorescents. I, this should be a law. I, I can't even believe that this, they still are allowing the manufacture of incandescent bulbs. It is such a huge difference in energy use. Um, how many are familiar with Focus on Energy? Have you heard of that program? Okay, Focus on Energy uh, has uh, in different incentives available. A lot of times they'll work with communities where you can get the, the uh, compact fluorescents at reduced rates or they'll get re you give you rebates on them. Uh, there's a variety of different programs. They offer some different workshops where they provide calculators where you can actually determine the cost savings on just on buying these the bulbs over a one-year period. And you're not talking pennies, you're talking tens of dollars a year in savings off of just changing from incandescent to compact fluorescence. Installing a programmable thermostat can make a big difference almost immediately. They're about a hundred bucks and you'll recoup that hundred dollars probably in the first winter. Uh, by, and by just having a, a, a thermostat that automatically adjusts your temperature down at night, you know, and then up during the day for heating and then vice versa for cooling in the, in the summer uh, can make a big difference in your heating bill. Cleaning your furnace uh, and your air conditioners, you know, that's one of those things that easily gets ignored and can save big money immediately and also cut down on the use of fossil fuels. If you live in a home that's 20 years old or older and you have not changed your, or updated your furnace, I can almost guarantee you that you could put in a new furnace and immediately save a significant amount of money on your energy bill and cut down on fo use of fossil fuels. <coughs> Easy way to tell. Go down in your basement and if your furnace has a aluminum double wall flue that's so hot you can't touch it, replace your furnace. The new furnaces that are coming out now, the exhaust pipe is a PVC plastic pipe that barely gets warm to the touch because they're so much more efficient, all the energy is going into your house and not up the chimney. So just try that. Go down to your basement and see. If you've got the old metal flue that's so warm you can't hardly touch it, I would definitely talk with a, a furnace uh, company and get a new furnace in there because you'll save a significant amount of money right off the bat and save our planet. Because all of it's going up the flue. All right, I'm going to whip through some of these quick. There's a whole list. There's a lot of things. One of the most important things you can do is insulate your home and weather strip your home. Just as an example, weather stripping. You could probably weather strip your whole house for 50 bucks. It wouldn't talk, cost you much at all. But think about this for a second. If you have under your doors, just your main entries into your home, if you've got a quarter inch of space under there times the width of the door, you know, so it's 32 inches, that's eight square inches, correct? Now take that times eight square inches times the number of doors in your house and how big of an open window do you have in your house all winter long? I mean, that, that's a good way to visualize the kind of energy savings you'll have out of just adding that weather strip to the bottom of your door. Now, the windows in your home, you can have the same kind of leaks. In fact, I read one article that talked about the average home has the equivalent of a one-foot window open all winter long by just the cracks and, and openings around doors and windows. 
Weather stripping, again, could make a huge difference to our planet and to your pocketbook. I think I'm going to try to end this here. Just a couple of big picture ideas. Another thing that we all need to start to do is encourage others to make change. And such as your schools, your businesses, talk to them about looking at their energy systems. Focus on Energy is a great program. They offer free consultations on, on the, how you can make your business uh, or your home more energy efficient. They have grants and loans available. Take advantage of these services. Um, become more active in helping to protect our world's forests. This is critical to the, sequest the sequestering of that carbon dioxide out of the air of the carbon and getting it back into plant matter so that it's not in the atmosphere. Very, very important. And the other thing is think about how you've got your money invested. What companies are you supporting through your investments? And I would strongly urge all of you to look at the socially responsible funds that are now available that don't invest in companies that have environmental uh, bad environmental records or produce military weapons or other things. And there's a variety of different ones, some that are just related to environmental issues, others that are in a broader social context. But I'd really, again, as a consumer, you have more power than you realize. And if we start using that power, we can truly reshape the earth. If you're interested, a lot of the information from the, for those charts that I had came from a book called The Consumer's Guide to Effective Environmental Choices. A great little book. You might want to consider taking a look at that. It was written by uh, Michael Brower and Warren Leon uh, for the Union of Concerned Scientists. But let me end with uh, the words of a famous uh, TV personality Kermit here. It's not easy being green, but it's getting easier. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Question. Yeah. If I can get this to there. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, some of the um, eco stuff that I've been going to, especially out in the urban bigger cities, there's people actually getting into it because it turned it into a business now. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have concern about green capitalism and how that's going to undermine things like like organics will be undermined by capitalism. I think again, as a I, I believe there's huge opportunity right now for creating a new economy based on sustainable practices. Um, with looking at what's available in, in renewable energy uh, uh, systems and solar collectors and the production of, of organic foods in the correct way, uh, there, I really believe that we can make some good, real changes to our economy. But what you're absolutely right that we've got to be careful and again, this is where being a responsible consumer is really important. We have to be able to discern the difference between uh, some of the larger companies that are now advertising organics, as an example, when they still have a completely unsustainable infrastructure. Uh, just because they might have an organic pro product doesn't mean we should buy that product. But I think that. Um, we really have an opportunity to make some changes to really start to have a more regionally based economy that really helps to help our neighbor. And we can start to have, start this by looking at our food systems and creating a more localized food system. And that can go on to other areas as well. Buying more of our products for building our homes. Most of those products, there's absolutely no reason why we're needing to buy wood from Canada or wood from South America or countertops from overseas. Why aren't those being produced in Wisconsin? Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really change 
to a much more regionally based economy and get away from having everything shipped from halfway around the world. Now, of course, that's never, there will be products that probably make sense to be made in other countries that we can still buy. But we can make a big difference by really looking at what it is we need to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Food, shelter, and energy. And if we really start to look at what economic opportunities are available to us by just trying to concentrate on providing those needs locally, I think we can make change almost immediately how vibrant our local economies are. And so I, I, I'm very hopeful right now for, for what's possible. I wasn't that way a couple of years ago. Yes? Focus on energy is a Wisconsin program. Um, a few years ago, it's actually paid through your uh, energy bills. Everybody pays into the, well, I shouldn't say everybody. People, the, all of the energy companies that are participating focus, give their money to focus on energy to take care of their responsibility as an energy company to help educate consumers about energy use, energy conservation, use of renewables, and so forth. Now, if you live with a, with a energy co-op, you may not be eligible for the focus on energy. Uh, what's, the, what's the energy company here? Yeah, they're, they're part of focus. Um, so if you get your energy from WPS, then you don't have a problem. Focus, is part, focus on energy works with them. And go to their website. There, it's a great resource uh, that you can find a lot of good information about energy use. Yes? The, the standard political economic stuff is reducing, reusing, doing all of these things will destroy the economy. How do you respond to that? Only if you are thinking very narrowly and mechanistically and are stuck in an old mental model based on using fossil fuels as your, as your main form of energy that drives the economy. Um, I really believe that there are options out there that we can use um, to get away from that mental model. There's a great book called Going Local by Michael Schumann that talks about this whole idea. Um, very, very good book. And uh, so I really believe that, that, it is, that it is possible. I, you know, you hear this at the national level. Um, George Bush has made this comment that we can't follow the Kyoto Protocol because it would kill our economy. Well, that's only if we still rely on fossil fuels. But if we start to look at other energy sources and really start to invest in renewables, it's the jobs that you might lose in that in the oil industry, you know, we are going to be creating thousands of jobs in those other sectors. So I really believe that those things would balance out. Would there be a, a lull or some problems at first? Yeah, there would be. But I think in the long run, we'd have a, a better economy as a result. As a follow-up. Yes. Our economy and most of the world economy is predicated on the notion that we have to have continued growth. 2%, 4%, the higher the better. Mm -hmm. Can we afford that? No. And I don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, the, the notion that, it, I, that it's just the growth that allows for economic well-being, I don't think it has to be true. There are ways of replacement and change and recycling money to different, uh, changing the, going to more of a service-based economy than a manufacturing-based economy. There's a lot of things that we can do that shifts that model, that mental model. And... Uh, that's the only option we have, because we can't, we can't have unlimited growth. It just doesn't work. That's not sustainable. Yes? I wonder if you're familiar with what happened in Cuba with, um, when the Berlin Wall fell down and um, gotten cut off by Russia with the fuel and how they had to very, very quickly, because in essence having peak oil hit them, convert to a more organic way and how their farms, because of the use of fossil fuels like we do in the United States, had no you know, organic matter left in them, how they had to rejuvenate that. Now I believe Havana itself has about 60 to 70% of their, their uh, produce is actually grown inside the city. 
So I wonder if you can comment a little bit about that, especially for people that are concerned with peak oil, and is it going to be possible if some major catastrophe happens that we could convert to a more organic, localized way of life? Well, there's a question I could speak for an hour on. Um, I think we would have a much tougher time adjusting the way Cuba did. Um, but I think it's possible for us to, to change. It would require some very major shifts in our own buying and our own uh, behavior for the kinds of foods that we expect to have. Uh, we won't be able to have oranges 12 months out of the year or fresh strawberries 12 months out of the year or whatever else. I mean, we, it would really, we'd have to really look at changing you know, the way we buy food and what we eat. And I think for some people that's going to be a major shift. But you know, we've been forced into that situation many times before in our history. If you go back to the Second World War and, and the Depression and so forth, and we've been able to come through those. And so I, I don't think it's impossible. But I, th it would, you're, I think it would be a very trying time. And I think it's important for us now to start helping educate people about this so we can start this change behavior before we reach that precipice where we have that huge fall and have to try to deal with it when it becomes uh, a very, very serious problem. So hopefully by getting out and talking to people in, in this way, we can maybe start to see those kinds of changes take place before we hit the edge of the cliff. Yes? I just wanted to say that I think it's really interesting how people are so worried about the economy going down by the way that, like with, if we would change the way that we work with it because if we don't change, then we're just gonna end up destroying the earth anyway, so there'll be no economy to work with. So I just find that amazing that that's such a big argument about the economy Well, think, change. Yeah, you're right, and it, but think about the mentality that large corporations ha right now have where what's really important is the next quarter's financial statement because the pressure in their minds is on what are the, how are the stockholders gonna react to our dividend announcement for the next quarter. So it's all very focused on short-term gain. And we have to start getting people to think in long-term, as I mentioned earlier, with the seventh, thinking for the seventh generation. That's a major shift in the way we think. But if we wanna survive, if we wanna have a world for our children's children, we have to start making these kinds of decisions and changes today. Yes, yes. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, when I was down um, in Florida visiting my grandparents with my mom and my sister, we went to a local grocery store to get a few things for the house and the grocer, my sister asked, do you have paper bags? And he said, no, we only have plastic. And he put basically every item in a separate plastic bag and my sister almost had a heart attack. She said, no, 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 we'll just carry the items out. And she handed him back all the plastic bags and he threw them all out as if they weren't able to be used, used again. The second time. And we all just stood there in shock because up here it's like we go to the grocery store, it's mm -hmm. paper bags. Because we mm -hmm. all know that you can't do anything with plastic bags except mm -hmm. go back and reuse them again at the store mm -hmm. when you go back. But it was just so shocking that a person would would do that, you know, it just, you don't understand, like, the lack of knowledge so many people have of the subject. Yeah, I just it, thought that was interesting. And that's, that's a, a great example that we could come up with a thousand more where people just have not made any connection between their consumption behaviors and how it impacts the earth. There's just, there is no connection, and that's what we have to change. And, and hopefully the more we can have these kinds of events uh, and we can spread the word to others and help them understand uh, that we have to start making those connections um, or we're going to run into some serious issues. Yes. Um, the uh, Wisconsin Trails Magazine, I think, had an article about what was going on up in northern Wisconsin. Yes, yes. Were you featured in that? Yes. You're been, okay. Yes. Um, could you talk about what the communities up there have been doing to promote a more sustainable lifestyle? Uh, that's another whole hour lecture. No, um, just very quickly, we, uh, we have something going on on Shawamigan Bay that is, is 
really exciting. We now have four municipalities on Schwamigan Bay that have adopted uh, resolutions to be eco-municipalities. And what that means is, is they have adopted the natural step framework. And very quickly, what that is, is it's adopting four principles. One is that as a community, we are going to reduce the use of uh, minerals and fossil fuels that come from the Earth's crust. We are going to eliminate the production of, or, or the, of placing man-made chemicals back into the environment. We are going to stop physically degrading the environment and we will take into account the needs of all people in all of our decision making. Those four principles are going to be sort of the guiding framework for all decisions made in the community. Now, that's pretty major for a city council or a town, or a town board to, to vote on and say, yeah, we're going to do this. Now, the, the key is for the citizenry to hold their feet to the fire and make sure as they do look at resolutions in the future or whether to approve an industri industrial park or add on to the coal burning power plant or whatever else, are they remembering the fact that they have signed on to that resolution? And that's going to be the key, fi the key for the community. But it's really exciting. There's a lot of energy right now in our, in our communities for making this work. And we have a strategic plan put together to really start to address uh, those, con those principles and really see some true change occur in our community. Um, the article in Wisconsin Trails talks about that. If you haven't seen that, the winter issue uh, has a great article about what's going on up on the bay. Uh, there's a website, another thing to write down if you'd like, allianceforsustainability.org. Uh, I presently am the chair of, of the steering committee for that organization and we're very involved in trying to get this uh, in initiative going in our community. And if you'd like to see what that strategic plan looks like, it's a, there's a PDF available on that website, just allianceforsustainability.org. Question? I think we'll take one more question and then wrap it up. And okay. please remember there's a reception right around the corner in the terrace room. Yes. So last question. OK, I have a, a comment and a question. But okay. um, a comment is that uh, several weeks ago, I went to the UW River Falls campus. and. Uh, well, on the tour, they went through a building that had been recently constructed, and it was an environmentally friendly building. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really thought was neat was the fact that they had a rainwater collection system installed where, they, you know, when it rained, they collected, you know, the rain, and they used it for all the flushing in the building. And I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. My question is, though, is uh, are there any areas in the United States that incorporate the, the district heating that you mentioned that they have in Sweden there? Is there any communities that have adapted that in our country? Yeah, I know there's some downtown districts in some of the larger cities in this country that have district heating. Um, it's not very common in, in smaller communities, but I know, it's, I know it is done in some cities. I couldn't name which ones they are, but I know it is around. Somebody know examples at all that they could say? warm and then they would actually take that and pump it into the homes and they would use that and it would be go back to the mines and drop into another mine huh. which was connected yeah and they there could is do, a they there could do that up in uh, Hurley Ironwood mm -hmm. the whole iron is the district up there sure we have a, a proposal in the city of Ashland right now uh, they have the city has just purchased a, a uh, full city, actually a couple city blocks of basically brownfield land that was used by a construction company that they're going to turn into an eco housing development and they are researching the possibility of hooking into the power plant and using the waste heat from the power plant uh, to provide heating for the homes in that, in that community. Yes.
Mm -hmm. Yep, I know. Great. All right, with, with that, let's please wrap it up. Please give Steve a hand, and please yeah, join us you. in the Terrace Room. Great. Thank you.